This story contains fantasy violence. And worms do not destroy. Part 4. The Messengers We are not assassins, grumbled Weta. No, agreed the magnate. But you are also not simple farmers. He looked at Yoff and sniffed. You. <laughs> you carry the Grilsey mark. I smell it on you. And that will last the rest of your life. He turned to Weta and sniffed. But you, but you, wild one, you have no smell, and so, no mark. It is as if you walk between the moons. For this, you are both dangerous, and only one so unpredictable can befit that ignorant clod, the nameless Rider. Shall I, Magnate? Yes. I fear the silver blades of my witless servants are dull indeed when it comes to this. My last formidable foe. The paladin of Penumbra gathered closer to their lord. Why not let him go free? asked Weta. If he slips your reach, then let him be, suggested Yoff. Nay, then the nameless rider suffers in the bowels of eternal torment. Only then will my sacred strength be known throughout this land. I will no longer be hidden in this green and gold place. All will rise up in my name. <laughs> Now, Pigney? Hey. <sighs> and my kingdom shall be revealed. The keen edge of my righteous power shall be known between every mountain. Praised in unending song. Now then, Pigney. Yes. Hmm. I will disempower that wretch before all who love me. <laughs> then none shall stand between me and the throne. Now, my magnificent, meritorious, munificent magnate. Oh, yes. Mm. I will rule with limitless power. Me, Drak. Me, the true righteous. Me, the final law. My days of subterfuge at an end. All thanks to the nameless rider, for his death shall prove to all. Revenge is the best whetstone for justice. Mm -hmm. Let it cleared his throat. 
As a servant of the blessed immortal king, I grant you no authority, he said calmly. And even with no weapon, I will tear you from your foul perch like a vulture off carrion. The magnate lowered his jangling arms and leaned back. Hmm. We are not your spear to throw, snarled Yoff. And even with no weapon, the newborn stand against you, you and your false kingdom. The magnate opened his cloak in the dark alcove. He ran his hands over his chest. Hmm. I will not do your bidding, cried Wedded, standing firm. I will never fight your enemy, whoever it is. Face us now. Yes, come into the light, strange one, so you may see your defeat at our hands, cried Yoth. Hmm? The magnate leaned forward on his stool. Hmm. Hmm. The emerald sunlight flicked off the scales of his burned flesh. His eyes were shut, covered in gelatinous tissue. From what accident or torture, they could not guess. He said. He scowled. He repeated. Why, whatever do you mean? <laughs> the magnate filled the glen with his rude cackle. <laughs> Kill them, you pathetic cretins. Do something. The magnate ordered. Kill them. <laughs> Before the brothers could react, the paladin stepped forward. The magnate roared. Got them like that. His words caught in his throat at the first stab. The seven paladin of Penumbra reached out into the light. Their many arms and many weapons became visible. The glow of their many eyes spat wisps of fire. Their limbs and blades arced in tight circles. These crooked bows sped back into darkness. The many weaponed arms enclosed the magnate. Like a metal silverfish. The magnate's head rolled forward and back as he hissed. How dare you? How dare you? The paladin would not relent, their weapons flying in and out of the light. Unseen, then seen, hidden, then visible. The magnate's cloak tore away. His body was hideous and scaly. You shall The magnate writhed in noxious death throes. He choked on his tongue. The magnate lifted his head back and disgorged a purple rot from the depths of his sunken chest and up into the air like a fountain of filth. The rot covered the hidden glen in a soppy bile. Paladin retreated. Their fires extinguished. The stacks of coin beside the brothers melted into pools of hot gold. 
shaken, Yoffin wet it, fled the obsidian alcove, and scrambled out of the glen. Rain fell in clumps. The canyon narrowed. The day before, the brothers had lost the road. They hurried on, deeper into the ravine, afraid they would be washed out by a mudslide. The rain along the trickle of river teased out juicy worms. They congregated and flopped together. Two tiny lights bobbed in the distance, steadily approaching the brothers. What did Anyoff listen to an unseen work beast neigh between the chatter of those lanterns? Then they listened to the creaky turning of aged wheels. A cart approached. The hubs of its wheels scraped against the rock wall before the cart plopped out again into a wider girth of the drowning river. Jofen Wedet watched as the cart driver lifted her head up. She was flanked by two other figures. All three slouched beneath hooded cloaks. The brothers stood aside, weapons at the ready. The work beast pulled the cart to a stop before them. The driver looked down at the travelers, curious. She scratched her cheek. Wedded glanced at a wooden box sitting in the back of the cart. Half as tall as an adult, it was fitted into a bordered bed, secured with rope and cord. As soon as he looked back to the driver, the box wobbled. In the dark rainy night, Wedded was convinced he imagined it. Who are you, then? The driver demanded. Brothers, Yoff answered. He stepped forward, his boots squishing in the pebbles in the mud. On our way to the king. The woman chuckled. <laughs> then you best turn round, for the blessed immortal king sleeps not in the north, nay, but yonder in the south. She nodded in the direction her cart traveled. That can't be, said Wedit. That's where we come from. The woman furrowed her brow. Maybe you came from the south, but not south enough? What? asked Yoff. Your south was still north, the woman said, nodding as though she had just convinced herself. Yoff noticed the figure on the driver's left moving his hands up and down. He was tying a thin string to two of his fingers, just below the knuckle. The man caught Yoff's look and explained. This is so I remember, if you're wondering. Remember what? asked Yoff. The figure on the other side of the driver leaned forward and answered. What this good lady says. <laughs> she held out her hands revealing all her fingers covered in knotted string. It's darn exciting. <laughs> Why not write it down, mumbled Joch. All three on the cart looked at one another before turning again to Joch. Their wet noses peeked out from their droopy hoods, and their eyes burned dimly within. Have ye not noticed the rain, boy? <laughs> Yof nodded. The box at the back of the cart jumped again. This time what it believed what he saw. What's in there? He asked, moving closer to the box. Oh, oh, let's see, let's see, said the man beside the driver. 
He turned his hands over. This way and that, he found a black string tied to his left thumb, dangling over his wrist. Oh. He exclaimed. Oh, I, I wouldn't go back there, Stripling. He answered. Stripling, shouted Wettit. You should come with us. Oh, there's no room on the cart. But you can walk alongside. Ready, then? Said the driver. Expecting the brothers would follow, she gathered the reins in a better grip. Hang on there, said Yoff. We don't even know who you are. Oh, we're messengers from the king. What, said Yoff, the king? Then you must know he lives in the north. Well, said the man messenger, retracting his strings inside his cloak. Well, I've, I've got so many things to remember, don't I now? Yes, 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 agreed the woman messenger. <laughs> many, many strings. We have to remove the old tails when a new tail comes up. A new string for the lady, you see. She looked at her hands, discerning which was which. Well, there's only so much room on our hands. Many, many strings. But then, Yelp stammered, one day the strings will all be replaced. It is a shame. Today replaces yesterday, doesn't it? The box wiggled. This cord back here ain't tight, said Wettit, calling from the rear of the cart. Stay away from that! The driver shouted. What's in there? Yolf asked. A nasty beast. Nasty. Help me, sir! Pleaded a small voice. When it squinted at the thin cracks in the wooden planks. Hello? He asked. Sir, they kidnapped me! Please! When it growled at the cart's master. You've got a child in there? A little girl? Nay, said the driver in calm reply. Tis a nasty beast, as I warned you. Do you not remember? She flipped the reins and the work beast started forward. She did warn you. I heard her. Oh, yes. Yes, I heard her too. Shall, shall I add a new string, then? Sir! Sir! cried the voice. Help! The box rumbled. No further, shouted Wettit. He threw his axe at the receding cart. The wooden box splintered, opening a hole equal in width to the axe head. The driver pulled on the reins. But it ran up and yanked out his axe. <clears throat> Yolf tensed. But it reached into the hole. <clears throat> A tentacle shot out and snared Wetted around the neck. <clears throat> the clammy limb slammed Wetted's forehead into the box. The hole widened, equal in width to Wettit's head. It will escape! shouted the driver, drawing a dagger. <laughs> Yelf knocked an arrow and shot the tentacle once. Twice. The monster in the box hissed and thrashed, tossing Wettit back into the mud. The driver sheathed her dagger. She cried, whipping the reins hard. Yeah! Then, in a wilting voice, the driver declared, And so, the brothers, in their unbelief, exposed 
the creature. Yelf glimpsed the nearest messenger frantically tying a new string to a finger. He tossed an old string off the side of the cart. The driver continued to mumble, but Yelf could not understand her. The box tipped, the box shook, but it did not break free. The tentacle whipped the air as the cart sped away into the rainy night. Yelf reached down to help his brother up. North or south? he asked, but it clutched his throat. North, he squeaked, clasping Yelf's hand. The brothers mounted a perilous hill overlooking a frozen lake. They climbed a precarious path between exposed and jagged stones. A charge of steeds exploded over the hill, kicking snow in all directions. When it crouched, axe in both hands, Yoff spun out his bow. The brothers turned in a tight circle, back to back. The cavalry hurried past them, galloping down the hill as if they were not there. The wind howled. The blinding snow changed direction. Yelf and Wet it twisted round and confronted an imposing silhouette suspended over them. A helmeted figure sat high in his saddle. The shape of the helm resembled a contorted wolf head. A banner flapped madly at his back. His steed stomped the icy ground. Snow slashed the air. Here, sirs, called the rider, raising his speech over the wind. Forged in the likeness of a dour face, the visor's persona hid the rider well, while aggrandizing his words, sharpening them with a harsh resonance. The rider threw a blanket at Wedded. Its wild flares of fur suggested it once belonged to a wolf. You'll have to share. I have but one. Wedded caught the blanket and threw it right on to Yoff. What name do you own? Wedded demanded. The rider looked behind the brothers, ahead into the scourge of snow. Wedded thought he was being ignored. His blood began to boil. His fingers clenched his axe even tighter. The rider's mask betrayed no emotion. Finally, he answered, The emptiness inside can have no name. Yul frowned. What it looked at the rider's banner beating in the air. He did not recognize the emblem. Are you foreign to these lands? What mark is that? My mark. But, what it snarled, do you fight for the blessed immortal king? One king does not serve another, the rider answered. Then you are a king? Yof asked, skeptical. The rider straightened up in his saddle. Every man a king, every woman a queen. 
The writer's metallic resonance grated with its nerves. He wanted to rip the mask off. Instead, he grumbled and flexed his arms. He looked at the banner again, a wolf on a green field, but the lower half of the fabric had been ripped away. The violent wind animated the image. The wolf ran in place, going nowhere. Where's the rest of this banner? asked Weta. Suspicion narrowed his eyes. The banner was torn, sir. Yes, but in what battle? insisted Yolf. Who did you slay? growled Weta. What home do you claim? cried Yolf. No battle, sirs. Only the final desperation of one I love quite dear. She wanted to keep me. As far as if I am foreign to these lands, you would have to tell me what land I am in. What home do I claim? None but where I ride. He adjusted his steed's reins in his gloved hands. Hmm, grumbled Yoff, wrapping the blanket tighter about his shoulders. Are you friend or foe? asked Wedded. Whom do you serve? asked Yoff. Where do you come from? asked Wedded. And where do you go? asked Yoff. And why? asked Wedded. The steed blew heated air through its nostrils and stomped the crunchy snow beneath its icy hooves. The rider gathered his reins and adjusted his posture. Wet it tensed, afraid he was about to bolt. The rider said, I am not a friend who fights Ashtooth in the west, nor foe who fights the blessed immortal king in the north. My service is to life, and it is before that growing, never-ending power which I bow, and none other. I have come from up high, musing with the Jibopanthus, and to the nameless ones of the deep do I go, squirming in their number. Do not ask the mountain hawk why it flies, or the swamp serpent why it crawls. When its frustration burst, he screamed, reached up, and yanked the rider's banner off its mounted hooks. They popped away into the snow. What it expected to enrage the rider, so they may fight. But the man merely looked down on him with the placid expression enforced by the mask. Infuriated, what it crumpled the rider's banner and shoved it inside his tunic, again trying to antagonize him. You may have all that I am, if you so wish, the writer said. There must be a why, blurted Yoff. There must be. Why take such an aimless journey if you are indeed masterless? If you serve no lord, there can be no first impulse, no clamor of virtue. No. (laughs) The writer laughed. A new weight pressed him deeper into his saddle. He said, I crossed every border of this island. Ate of every fruit. from every brook. Years, searching for the one who begat me. I had been wise in the morning, smelling every flower. And I had been foolish in the night, plucking every stem.
in between, under the watchful eyes of the sea pharaoh. My quest has been populated by all manner of this garden's denizens. But I have yet to meet him. The steed pawed at the snow. Let's leave this one, said Yoff, putting his bow away. I'm chasing my own rear end. He may be mad, said Wedet, but his idle prattle does reveal himself. No master, he says? And he carries his own banner? A criminal. It is plain. <laughs> it's him. The one we have heard of. Let us bring this writer to justice. We have no proof of his crimes. And he does not hinder our journey. Leave him. Let us go. No, cried Wedet with indignation, lifting his axe. Hold, cried Yoff. I am not certain we are enemies. I am certain, said Wedet. This diseased mind will infect all it reaches. The magnate may have been vile, but do his words not have some truth? On the farm, did we not deal with the injured steed in this way? For its own good we did so. To let it live in misery was the greater wrong. Brother, does not a sickness of the mind cause as much suffering as one of the body? And both can be contagious. But what if we are the sick ones? Then we could not tell the healthy from the infirmed. What it did not hear his brother's question. My crimes are indeed many, said the writer. But I do not grant that law is the final moral judge. No law? gasped Yoff. See, brother. Now let us bring this writer to justice. It is what the blessed immortal king would want. You know this. Let it turn the axe in his hands. The writer looked upon the axe shining out of the snowstorm and said, A threat, sir? For what ill have I done you, then? For flying colors not of this land, said Wedet. If you do not serve the blessed immortal king, then you are an enemy of mine. There can be no argument. Any parley would be mere fantasy. And how shall I fight you? The rider shifted his sheath, which they now saw fastened to his left hip. He showed them it was empty. Why carry an empty sheath, Yolf argued. He doubled over in pain. The Gwilsi wound reminding him of its long presence. His side bled through every layer of his clothes. But it moved to catch Yof. But his brother waved him away. A reminder of what I was, said the writer. You lost your sword, let it suggested. If in losing one finds, then yes. Let it cupped his hand and whispered to Yoff under the snowy gale. See? Adel, this one. Been out in the wilds too long. But it lifted his eyes up to the rider's stoic visage. Not finding what you seek, rider, where now do you journey? Where shall the Seafro find you in the last day? Come, let my axe help you there. <laughs> I no longer seek anything upon this island, it is true, said the rider. He looked to each cardinal direction with every fragment of his reflection. I seek a new kingdom. I seek where no warrior can tread. Where the thief dares not come near. 
and where the worm does not destroy. Wet had had enough. He tore the rider from his saddle, throwing him down to the frozen ground, cracking his armor against the ice. The angry steed reared and scrambled down the hill, knocking Yoff off his feet and onto his backside. He lifted his head to see the mount vanish quickly, lashed by the snow. I have the answer, said Wedet. You speak of death. You seek oblivion. 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 Next time on Part 5, The Minister. And you promise you have served the blessed immortal king all your days? We do promise, O Minister, answered Yoff, his words eager. We do promise, O Minister, mimicked Wedet, his words clumsy. Then reveal your heart's desire. Make it known to me, his gracious minister, that I may sugar your indelicate words for the refined tastes of the blessed immortal king. And Worms Do Not Destroy Starring Steve Rudolph as Wedded, Yoff, and the narrator. Featuring Kareem Cronfley as the Magnate and the Nameless Rider, Elizabeth Novotny as the Good Lady and the Creature, A.J. Beckles as the Man Messenger, and Sarah Golding as the Woman Messenger. Written and produced by William J. Meyer. Thanks for listening. <laughs>